Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone today to worship at Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ. It is good to be together here at Orchard Ridge. We like to say that we are a community striving to be spiritually alive, joyfully inclusive, and committed to justice. Along with our denomination, the United Church of Christ, we affirm that no matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So welcome this morning. My name is Kate Mackey. I am one of your pastors, and we have Ken Pennings with us today as well, another one of your pastors. And Julia Berkey, our senior pastor, is away for a time of renewal with her family, so we wish her and uh, Daniel and Revery uh, blessings on their time today. If you are new or recently returning to Orchard Ridge, we want to say an extra special welcome to you and thank you for being here today. I'd like to invite you, if you would, um, to, to sign our friendship pads, which are in the little pew sides, or chair sides beside you. That's a way that we can um, get some information if you'd like to share it with us. We share our, our announcements weekly on, by email, so that's an especially good way if you'd like to stay connected to sign in that way. Um, we'll make sure to, to get you up to date on all of the wonderful things happening here at Orchard Ridge. Uh, another a quick announcement you'll notice in your book. There are a lot of different opportunities that might be of interest to you. Uh, I was prompted to, to remind you all, and woohoo, that's right. So this is something that we do every year. It's not something, you know, you sign up once and, and are done. It's something that we continue to give of ourselves to try new ministries as well. There might be something new to you. You want to meet some new people. So I encourage you to fill this out today. It, you'll have an opportunity to, to put it in the offering plate, either up front or as it goes by. We have our welcomers who will pass those around later on in the service. These will also be with us for the entire month of April. And so um, if this Sunday you take it home and want to think about it, you can bring it back next Sunday. There'll be more opportunities to fill this out as well. Some of you may know or realize that Easter is not just one day. Who knew that? Yeah, oh, wow, a lot of us. Yeah, Easter is a whole season of time. And over the next several weeks, we call it Easter Tide, we'll be celebrating that season of Easter, the season of resurrection together. Building on our Lenten theme, which was becoming death doulas, we are now entering the other side of life and death. And our theme for the next several weeks is becoming midwives of the resurrection as we are called to help birth new life into the world together. Those will be the themes that we consider over the next several weeks. As we begin, I'd like to invite us to take a moment of centering. So I want you to invite you to take a breath and release. We'll take another breath and release. Take another breath and release. We'll begin together with a centering song. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. We'll have it played once through by Bruce on the piano and we'll be invited to enter in together in a state of meditative song two times through following that.
O majesty, O magnificence, O mystery, come. Be and break our Yes, in the dry country of our souls, let your grace reign. So let it take root in you and grow. Make of us trees strong in all seasons. Bearing good fruit, giving shade to all weariness, and shelter to them that are lost. So we pray to the glory of Jesus Christ. I invite my young friends to come forward with me, or those of you who are young at heart, come on down. Welcome. How was your spring break? Pretty good? Awesome. But it's great to be back at school, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got mostly yeses, one no, I heard there. Well, welcome. I'm so glad to have you down here with me this morning, or up here. And I um, wanted to tell you that later in our service, Rael will be doing a Bible lesson or a sacred reading from the Bible, from the Gospel of John. And it's the story of Jesus appearing to his disciples after he rose from the dead. And he offers the disciples a wonderful gift. And that gift is peace. Twice, he says to his disciples, peace be unto you. And Fiona's right down here. She's helped us learn a song that she wrote herself. And she says in the song, when I feel peaceful, I feel loved. And when I feel loved, I have no fear. So there's something about peace that helps us overcome all our fear. And the word that Jesus actually used, he spoke in Aramaic or possibly in Hebrew. And the word for peace in Aramaic and in Hebrew is shalom. Can you say that with me? Shalom. Again, shalom. Again, shalom. So that word in Aramaic and in Hebrew, shalom, actually is the kind of peace that drives out fear. So it's a very rich, powerful word, right? So in a bit, I'm going to have you ex extend the peace of Christ or shalom to the members of the congregation who are seated here. So you'll go around and say shalom to about 10 people if you're quick. All right, but in the meantime, I want us to do a little celebration of the peace of God. John is going to stand and sing for us in Hebrew, and in his singing in Hebrew, you'll hear the word shalom a number of times. So you'll know, even though you're hearing a song in Hebrew, it's all about shalom. It's about peace. So are you ready? Let's make a big circle around the communion table. Let's try not to knock over flowers, right? But we're going to sing. While, we're going to dance while John sings. O se shalom bim romav hu ya se shalom aleinu ve al kol la olam va imru amen. O se shalom bim romav hu ya se shalom aleinu. Ve alcohol, ve alcohol, la olam, ve imaru, amen. Everyone. 
עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו. ועל כל לעולם ואימרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ועל כל לעולם ואימרו אמן Now children, would you run off and greet the members of the congregation with the word Shalom. Thanks so much, children. Kate has a word of instruction for you. All right, so before anyone who wants to go down for uh, Music Connections, second through sixth graders, welcome to go to Music Connections. Anyone who didn't get a children's bulletin today, I'll put them, they'll be here for you before you go. You're welcome to take one. And then also, if we have any confirmation students who wanted to do one of their confirmation notes today, Worship confirmation notes, I have those as well. Dev, way to go, he's got it already. If anyone else wants one, oh, Sage has them too. Sage, Nathan, and Charlotte all are doing them along with Dev. Congratulations, everyone. I didn't even need to print them. Perfect. So kids, welcome to grab one of those or go down to Children's uh, Music Connections. And we'll see you later on in the service. Okay, well, coming up next is our compassion offering. And every month we have a new organization that we support in the community. Sometimes they're local, very close by. Sometimes they are um, overseas, abroad. And all loose, uh, loose bills and anything marked compassion offering that comes in our offering today will go towards that offering. In the month of April, we are supporting one great hour of sharing. And we have a short video to introduce us to this new opportunity to share. It's an ecumenical opportunity to, to give joining brothers, sisters, siblings in Christ around the world. So we'll go ahead and see a little bit more about that. I think we might have to do it next week. <laughs> I see we have some word, some closed captioning on the bottom, but it's about three minutes long, so we don't, probably don't want to read for three minutes. So Ben, you can go ahead and pause that. I'll just say that um, it's, it's an organization that brings people together, brings denominations together to send funds out to some of the most um, urgent needs in the world. So this is a, an organization that brings together the United Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, the PCUSA, I think a, a number of or, uh, denominations together so that we can make a bigger impact caring for refugees, caring for issues of hunger um, throughout the world. The, you'll hear throughout the month of April more and more about what this organization does, but let me tell you, it is beautiful work around the world. So at this time, as you are able, I'd like you to invite you to either come up and share your offering here in the basket. There will be baskets passed around, along with your, um, your fill out the sheets in your bulletin. If you have that as well, that can go in the offering basket as we receive some beautiful music from Vicki and Bruce.
Thanks so much, Vicki and Bruce. We turn now to a time of prayer, and I'd like to begin with some prayers of joy. Joy for the beautiful and meaningful celebrations of Holy Week and Easter. How many of you carried the glow with you all last week? I sure did. Resurrected God. For all who purchased Easter flowers in honor or memory of a loved one, and if this is you, you're welcome to take one of your flowers home with you after worship today. Resurrected one. And for the many encouraging signs of spring. Resurrected one. Many concerns of health. For Bev Taylor's dear friend and mentor, Joe Hoosti, who has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. For Bill Berkey, Julia Berkey's uncle, who has elected to go on hospice. Prayers for his wife, Diana, daughter, Lara, and for the whole Berkey family. For Sherry Olson, who broke both bones in her left wrist from a fall in the home last Friday. She'll have a surgery to plant a plate in her wrist in about a week. For John Blanchard's golf partner, who had a severe stroke for his wife, who decided to remove life support. For Deanna and John Blanchard's friend Dave, who broke his leg in three places while skiing. For a member of Barb Wells' family, who recently suffered a major health crisis. For Pam Oliver's and John Lemke's daughter Z and her spouse Carl, as Carl seems to be recovering well from a relatively minor heart attack, but they're worried about the causes and consequences of it. For Jory Gasser's roommate's 24-year-old female friend who's been having seizures on and off and is now in a medically induced coma as doctors try to figure out what's causing the seizures. For Amy Kell, grieving the death of her dear friend Helen, who died of renal failure this past Wednesday. For Jennifer Egerlin Beck's niece Marika, who, after a tough setback earlier this week, was able to go home from the rehab center. While it will be wonderful for her to be home, she's still very restricted in movement. Thus, caretaking will be very demanding for Jennifer's sister, Lisa. Strength and comfort for the family as they figure out a new routine. Resurrected one. For the murder of seven world Central Kitchen aid workers on April 1st, whose deaths bring to a total of rough, roughly 200 aid workers killed so far in Gaza. These are people who gave everything they had to provide food, water, <clears throat> humanitarian aid, and medical supplies in the midst of both indiscriminate and targeted killing. Resurrected one. For the people of Haiti, experiencing widespread ga gang violence. For those grieving the deaths of people killed in the bridge collapse in Baltimore. We pray for an immediate ceasefire in Israel-Palestine and for a diplomatic solution to the conflict and warfare there. And for the war-torn country of Ukraine. Resurrected one. Now I invite you to Lift up all the joys and concerns in your own heart and a few moments of silence. Resurrected one. May we share together in the prayer Jesus taught his friends. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Shalom. Shalom. Our sacred reading today is from John 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Shalom. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the witness of the people of God. Last Sunday, as you know, was Easter, and our gospel reading from John on that day included Mary Magdalene's joyful words, I have seen the Lord. And in response, we sang, Alleluia, and we cheered, Christ is risen. Christ is risen risen indeed. However, it appears that Jesus' disciples did not have the same reaction to Mary's news. Because here they are in our story, huddled together behind locked doors out of fear for their own lives, wondering if they might face the same fate as Jesus on the cross. They had seen the empty tomb, and they had heard Mary's witness of seeing their risen Lord, but the meaning of all of these events was still a mystery to them. Maybe we, too, at times, wonder about the meaning of it all. What does the resurrection mean? Can we prove it? Theologians and ordinary Christians alike have pondered and argued about this for literally thousands of years. There's a whole branch of inquiry called apologetics that is dedicated to debating the facts of faith. I listened to a podcast recently in which the host ran through the top 10 atonement theories, and I know that's a very nerdy pastor kind of podcast to listen to, (laughs) but the top 10, clearly there are many ways that people have come to understand the atonement, how we understand, how we think about what the death and resurrection of Jesus accomplished many ways that we have tried to make sense of this, what happened on Easter morning a couple of millennia ago. So we could debate until we are blue in the face about the hows and the whys of what we claim happened on that day, but there is a mystery at the heart of it all. However, I think one thing that resurrection does show us is that despite the reality of death in the midst of our uncertainty, our loss, and our fear, 
Jesus still shows up. They didn't understand what had just happened to them, but Jesus showed up for those frightened disciples. Imagine what it must have been like for them on that day to have Jesus' presence with them. Their beloved leader, the one whom they thought would be their savior, their Messiah, has been brutally murdered by the Roman government. Some of the women, if you can even believe them, (laughs) claim that he rose from the dead. But then he suddenly appears in their locked room and he shows them his hands and his side. It is an embodied experience, not just something they believed in the life of their mind. Imagine their shock. Yet Jesus doesn't try to convince them He doesn't cajole them. He doesn't explain anything at all, really. He just says, for the first of what would eventually through John be a total of three times, he says, peace, shalom, peace be with you. And to what is frightening and uncertain, Jesus says, peace. He doesn't offer them an explanation. He doesn't offer them justification. He simply offers them his presence and speaks peace. Then he commissions them. He sends them out. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And in what, in, in what would today be not a very uh, COVID-friendly moment, <laughs> Jesus breathes on the disciples. <sighs> This act is not meant to recall face masks, but (laughs) to help us remember the image of God creating humanity, breathing life into the dust at the start of it all. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus says. The disciples are filled with new life and told that now they are the ones sent out with an important job to do, to share God's peace and to forgive one another. Thomas, one of the disciples, wasn't in the room when Jesus first shows up. His friends urge him to believe they're excited about it. They share the miraculous news of Jesus' return. But Thomas says, nope, uh uh-uh. I'm not going to believe it unless I see it for myself. Thomas gets a bad rap for doubting. But he's really not so different than anyone else. The other disciples also needed to see Jesus, to encounter Jesus' presence before they were able to rejoice. I've come to believe that this little story about Thomas isn't so much about Thomas' doubt, but about Jesus' grace. The risen one's willingness to meet Thomas exactly where he was. Thomas needed to see with his own eyes, and Jesus gave him what he needed without any shame. Thomas' response, as we heard, to experiencing the presence of the risen one was to shout out in praise, my Lord and my God. The risen Christ continues to show up for us too. Christ meets us in our lives right where we are. We don't have to have it all figured out. Our lives don't have to be perfect. In fact, it's usually right in the midst of our mess, our brokenness, our uncertainty, is exactly where we are found by the crucified one, the one who has scars just like we do. I came across a real a story I gotta get those words mixed up, but it was on Instagram, so whatever those ones are. (laughs) Last week from someone I follow named Shannon T.L. Kearns. He's an ordained priest and author of In the Margins, A Transgender Man's Journey with Scripture. And Shannon offered a reflection on this particular passage from John chapter 20 and how he reads scripture as a trans person. Shannon shared, Jesus, in his resurrected body, still had his scars. As a transgender man, I am someone who lives with scars, 
and learning to love my body has been a really challenging journey. He continues on, but this story of Jesus and Thomas tells me that resurrection is not about our scars going away, but about our scars becoming holy. The world we live in sure has a lot of scars these days. Do you see how long our prayer concern list was today? Wounds inflicted on our planet through human consumption and greed. Places torn apart by war, Gaza, Ukraine, and others that rend the fabric of our human community. Anti-LGBTQIA plus legislation that's sweeping through state houses all over the country. And, 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 fill in the blank. And I know that many of us today feel the weight of our own personal losses and uncertainties, the wounds, the scars that we carry. Let's just all take a collective deep breath, right? I understand and sometimes feel the temptation to want to hunker down like Jesus' disciples, hiding away for fear of the world. The thing is, while divine love meets us right where we are, we aren't left there. Despite their fear, despite their doubt, despite their uncertainty, Jesus' disciples were empowered and sent out to share the good news of the risen Christ who brings peace and forgiveness. Earlier in the Gospel of John chapter 10, Jesus had told them that it is the thief who comes to kill and destroy. And in contrast, Jesus comes so that you might have life and have it abundantly. It's one of my favorite verses, that you might have abundant life. So even as we wade through what seems like death, nothing but death and destruction, we are held in life and the hope of resurrection. Resurrection power has been unleashed into the world throughout all generations. And the witness of life through God's spirit didn't die with Jesus, but has continued on through that spirit-breathed life of the community that he established. Whether we are in doubt, whether we are in fear, Jesus comes. And we are invited as part of this heritage of saints, spirit-breathed saints, to become like midwives to the resurrection, to see the glimmers, as Pastor Julia mentioned last Sunday, of the resurrection, and to lift them up. Jesus may not walk through locked doors or offer us his little, literal wounds to touch, but Jesus, offer, but Jesus shows up when we offer our presence to one another. When we offer our presence to one another, what has been a place of wounding can become the mark of resurrection. Catholic priest Henry Nouwen, who was a beloved devotional writer of the 20th century, wrote about the idea of being a wounded healer, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept. To this, Nouwen says, Jesus has given this story a new fullness by making his own broken body the way to health, to liberation, and new life. Thus, like Jesus, those who proclaim liberation are called not only to care for their own wounds and the wounds of others, but also to make their wounds into a major source of healing power. While we might feel overwhelmed at times by the state of the world, there are moments when we can catch those glimmers of healing power at work. One example that came to my mind as I was thinking of these things this last week is the Me Too movement. Have you all heard of that? The phrase was first coined in 2006, actually earlier than a lot of us know about. 
by the civil rights activist Tarana Burke, who was herself a survivor of sexual assault. And she started using this phrase to bring women of color in particular together who had experienced sexual violence and harassment. She brought them together for empowerment. This phrase really took off, however, in 2017, when several actresses, prominent people, uh, outed Harvey Weinstein for sexual abuse in a New York Times article. And then actress Alyssa Milano followed it up with a tweet, when we still called it Twitter back then, with a tweet inviting others to share their own stories with the hashtag MeToo. I'm sure many of you remember how this turned out, the outpouring of stories and solidarity as millions upon millions of women who had experienced sexual trauma and harassment around the world reclaimed their voices as they shared their experiences. Sociologists and people who study these kinds of things are still taking stock of what the impact of the Me Too movement was and continues to be. But it is clear that six years out, that in the US there have been tangible changes as a result of brave people sharing their experiences of a topic that generally has remained taboo, held in silence and in shame. According to the Pew Research Center in 2022, which was five years after Me Too began, 70% of Americans reported that people who perpetuate workplace sexual harassment are more likely to be held to account. And over 60% of these respondents said that people who come forward with allegations are more likely to be believed. According to a recent Forbes article, the impact goes beyond an individual's experience and has even moved into some systemic change. As of 2023, 24 states in the District of Columbia have passed more than 80 workplace anti-harassment and anti-retaliation bills. Major businesses and institutions and industries such as the trucking industry, the military, and even the NFL have seen high-level perpetrators brought to justice and internal reporting structures changed. While there is still a long way to go, I view Me Too as one of those glimmering resurrection moments that continues to glimmer today. We, together, are commissioned to see, to notice, to uplift, and participate in the abundance of resurrection life. The very end of our gospel reading today says that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that were not written about in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Jesus shows up for us and invites us into abundant life. Our scars may still be with us, but they can be transformed. They can be made holy with resurrection life. Filled with God's spirit, we are sent out to bring that abundant life into the world to follow Jesus as we show up for one another. And through the Spirit, we proclaim this message into the face of fear, doubt, and death. Peace be with you. Shalom. You are forgiven. Believe and have abundant life. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion today, I'd like to invite you to stand together as we sing hymn number 244. Thank you.
Please be seated. We gather together today at this table remembering that Jesus shared a meal with his friends on the night before he would give up his life. They did not understand what tragedy was about to unfold. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, every time they shared a meal, even an ordinary bread and cup, they remembered that night, that meal, and they re received reassurance that every part of their lives, even that which was broken and painful, was held together in something greater, in resurrection life. And we, too, are held in, in the resurrection power of Christ. Even in the midst of death, we are called into life. This is the promise of abundant life everlasting here and now that we receive. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he blessed it. And he offered it to his disciples, saying, this is my body. As often as you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he poured out the cup. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, which is a symbol of my love for you, my forgiveness for many, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Holy God, through your spirit, you make us one with you and one with one another. Be near to, the, to us now in this bread and this cup to know your presence and your peace. Fill us with an assurance of your love and your grace, empowering us to live out abundant life for the sake of all. Amen. We welcome all to this table. You need not be a member of this church or a regular attendee. You may not even consider yourself a person of faith. You are welcome here. We offer gluten-free and gluten bread, so we invite you to take a piece of bread and dip it in the goblet. The light-colored, yeah, that's the gluten, gluten-free. The light-colored liquid is wine. The dark-colored liquid is grape juice. We have three stations for you to receive communion, and we'll move from the front row of seats to the back so we invite the two side sections to come forward to the stations here and here, and we invite the two center sections to partake of communion out in the crossroads. And if these two sections see that the lines are shorter here, feel free to visit either one of these front stations. And if you have trouble coming forward to receive communion, we'll bring communion to you. The ancient Hebrews dreamt of a land flowing with milk and honey as a symbol of freedom, flourishing, and the fullness of life. Many of the early Christians shared a cup of milk and honey in addition to bread and wine at their Easter celebrations. During the Easter season this year, our communion breads, gluten-free and wheat, are made with milk and honey. Come, celebrate. The feast is ready.
gratitude for the cup and the bread that we have received and the spirit of Christ that we share together as we close today, I would like to invite you to stand for our closing hymn, number 253. send you out two quick invitations in the friendship hall. One is to see Luann, who is going to wave her hand here. We have the opportunity, as we often, we do a couple times a year, to provide meals for the students at the Crossing down on UW campus. It's our progressive Christian um, student organization, and that's happening this week on Wednesday. So if you have some heart for youth and want younger people, I should say, young adults um, and want to support that, please see Luann for signups. And then the second thing is in the Friendship Hall, I also have a big pad of paper that has a question written on it. What is the Bible? And that is because our confirmation children, youth, are talking about the Bible tonight in confirmation at 3.30. So if you want to give a little hint of what you think the Bible is and what it means to you, you're invited to share your thoughts there and we'll bring it to um, our youth this afternoon. So, people of God, you are spirit breathed with peace to go into this world together, 
sharing in the life of Christ, resurrection life abundant. Go in peace and with great joy. Amen.